You're listening to Tatiana is Everyone, an Orphan Black podcast. My name is Chris. And my name is Stephanie. And in this episode, we're discussing the second episode of season five of Orphan Black, entitled Clutch of Greed. And while we will talk about anything and everything that happened in that episode, there shouldn't be any spoilers for future episodes. Shall we start off with some feedback that we got from Fred? Yes. Do you want me to read that or do you want to read it? Either way. You, you go for it, Chris. Fred says, wow, this was a very nice and exciting episode, fully in the Orphan Black tradition, which I agree with. Fred. I agree, too. Packed with new info and a lot of rapid scene changes. An episode to watch at least twice. I really liked it, and not only because some scenes were filmed at locations I visited last October, especially behind Felix's loft and at Mrs. S.'s house and Kara's school. What I really liked was the double twist in the plot. First, everybody is cooperating with Rachel and her neos, and Sarah can't believe it. Then at home, suddenly it proves that also the others were just playing along, and then at the end, Sarah is all alone again. This is a really Sarah-driven episode, and it works because you really feel with her. Just as last week, it was a kasima driven episode. I think maybe the fact that it was sort of Sarah-centric is also making it feel, for me at least, more like sort of your classic Orphan Black episode. It's true. Not that there's anything wrong with a kasima centric episode. There's not. You, uh, of course there's not, because if you said that, <laughs> I would be upset. Which is why I wanted to clarify that I am not <laughs> saying that. I am definitely not saying that. But as we've discussed many times, most episodes are pretty much centered around Sarah. So how did you feel about this episode, Chris? I have complicated feelings about this episode. Uh, some of the things in there I did not like, which I think everybody listening knows what that is, uh, specifically the one thing. And there's the other thing, which is just difficult. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, I feel like people know what I'm talking about. Anyway, but I thought I thought it was a good episode, which feels weird to say. What about you? Yeah, I agree with with you. I feel like it was a well put together episode and definitely in sort of the classic orphan black tradition, which sounds weird to say of a five year old show, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> However, I, I have I have strong emotions and mixed feelings about the events that unfolded. Uh, but I feel like this is a, an instance where I'm not entirely sure how to feel in the moment. I have to see how things play out before mm -hmm. I can fully form an opinion about some of the stuff that happened. I agree with you. I, I get what you're saying. I guess I'm kind of giving them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt so far. Mm. This is not to say that I won't change my mind on this. Mm -hmm. Because it's entirely possible, but... In and of itself, I don't necessarily hate it as a story point. I want to clarify this. The fact that the thing happened, I am mad about. But yeah, like you said, I have to see how it plays out. I have to see where the story is going from here. Yeah. Let's get started by talking about Sarah and by extension, Kira in the storyline, because I feel like they're... Their actions were very intertwined and, and affected each other in this episode. It, mm -hmm. th and, and this was a tough episode because I'm always, I'm always upset when there's a rift between Sarah and Kira. I mean, that's the point. Right. And yeah, I, I mean, ouch my heart, you know? Still, it's been, a, it's been a couple days, but I'm still feeling it. And I feel like this is something, we've seen something similar before, you know, back in, I want to say it was back in season two, where Kira got upset with Sarah for having to leave her again and leaving her with Cal. And while that sort of tension is, isn't a new thing for them, I, I feel like this feels so much worse than what was going on between the two of them in season two. Right. And I, I feel like at least once a season, there's sort of at least one exchange where things get really sort of tense between them. Mm. Because Sarah does have that history of leaving. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it, I think, I think maybe that's part of it is 
this time it's not that Sarah is trying to leave Kira. It's that Sarah is trying to hold on so tight and Kira is the one who's essentially separating herself a little bit. I think maybe that's part of why this feels different. Mm -hmm. I think it could also feel different because Rachel is involved this time. And Kira is actually choosing to go with Rachel instead of staying with Sarah, which feels like a betrayal almost. Yeah, absolutely. But we'll get to Rachel because I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> but in regards to Sarah and Kira, I think something that did feel spot on for me in this episode was that all of, of Sarah and Mrs. S's and Felix's attempts to go into hiding to try to, to save Kira from Mrs. S, or sorry, try to save Kira from Rachel. I understood why they wanted to do it, I, and I understood where they were coming from, but it felt so haphazard and and not entirely – they weren't entirely in control of the situation, and I, and I kind of was on Kira's side in a way because of that. They just felt so desperate about it. Right. And I could kind Which, of I see – Which, I mean, makes sense in terms of the story because absolutely. the whole idea is like, if we're going to do this, we have to do this right now. There's no time to plan anything better. Right. So, yeah, it all makes sense. But at the same time, you're kind of like, hang on now. Mm -hmm. are, are we sure about this? Right. Because you could – and they gave us a good glimpse into Kira getting back to normal and enjoying it. You know, we get to see mm -hmm. her be in school and really liking her teacher, who's a cutie pie. <laughs> I kind of love Mr. Mitchell. I really hope we see more of Mr. Mitchell. Me too. <laughs> I think I think Mr. Mitchell might be my Raj. Oh, I'm so glad you found a Raj. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We get to see her having fun at school, really feeling accepted and kind of like she fits in and having more of a normal life because, you know, and that's kind of where she was at when the show started. She was Sarah was gone and she missed her mom. But she was with Mrs. S. She had kind of a stable existence. And in the past several years, she's really just been pulled from place to place. And, and I, can, I can get it from Kira's perspective. She just wants to be a normal kid, you know? So I, I, I really understood – I understood her frustration as much as I am worried for Kira to go with Rachel and be submitted to medical testing. I, I understood where she was coming from. Right. I'm so stressed out about this. Mm. And I'm I'm glad they led up to this point, actually, because this, this entire show has been about these women, these clones, wanting to have autonomy over their bodies to to understand who they who they are. And so I'm kind of glad that we've come to where Kira is sort of asking similar questions. I thought that was really great too, the the whole I want to know why I'm like this. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that's the theme of the show. And somebody just, like, flat out said it. <laughs> so I, I sort of appreciate that. And I, I think it echoes especially Kasima's storyline mm. that we've had throughout the series, really, because, you know, she's actively pursuing the science and often just straight up equates herself with the science. So, And she's the clone who has most negatively been impacted sort of on a physical level by being a clone like kira like kira is experiencing her her differentness on in a physical way than i think definitely sarah and helena and particularly allison has yet to really experience because allison to our knowledge has not shown any symptoms of the the prion disease so mm -hmm. it, you know that makes sense that you, you there's could be some similarity between kira's storyline and kasima's storyline right and even more than physically emotionally yes since... absolutely Kira's whole thing is that she can feel the other clones. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, really, you can't blame her for wanting to know why she's like that. Yeah. But it's very worrying to see Kira going with Rachel. I want to trust Rachel because Kira seems to trust Rachel. And in the past, that has been a good indicator of who to trust and who not to trust. But it's Rachel. I, I, I'm, I'm still so not in not willing to trust her yeah yeah i'm in this weird limbo because yeah it's rachel who is terrible but also what the heck has happened to rachel i, I because something I clearly did she genuinely smiled 
Chris. I was so, and this is, I think, a testament to Tatiana Maslany's acting. I, I, I f- felt it on a physical level the moment when Rachel smiled, and it was a real smile. Like I, did, I, it, did it creep you out? Because it creeped me out. It creeped me out. I sat backward in my couch. I felt a little like pressed back by it. <laughs> It's kind of like, you know, that moment on Arrested Development where where Lucille goes and she hugs Michael Bluth and he's like, what are you doing? Why why are you pressing me with your body? I feel like that's what I felt toward Rachel. Like, what are you doing? Why are you moving the corners of your mouth upward? What is this? <laughs> I know what it is when other people do it, but, but you're doing it. What is this? What is this? I am I am very dubious. Uh, but... And and I feel a little bit, it's not quite as bad, because I think the whole point of Rachel's sudden change is that there's the mystery of, like, what, what caused Rachel to change? Who is this P.T. Westmoreland guy who seems to have caused this change in Rachel? But I do feel a little bit like I have some Rachel whiplash, the way that I had Delphine whiplash at the beginning of season three. But it's not quite as bad. Yeah. I think because there is this explicit external force in this one. Absolutely. Because, like, the situation changed with Delphine, but we couldn't tell what Delphine's thought process was exactly. Yeah. Maybe? I don't know. Not that we can tell what Rachel's thought process is here, but I think there's more explicitly an inciting event that, that could be causing it. I don't know. And if Rachel is telling the truth, it seems to be because P.T. Westmoreland finally gave her a sense of purpose. I guess I don't know. I'm, I'm still so skeptical about P.T. Westmoreland. I know. I'm like, did did he hypnotize her? What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have no idea, no idea what happened to Rachel. Though we we definitely in this episode we see the big change in her, specifically in how she relates to Ferdinand. Personally, I'm not. I'm not too happy with that line that she has about how I'm I'm not going to hit you, Ferdinand. I don't need to anymore. I like I understand where it's coming from and how it's supposed to demonstrate a change in her as a person, but I do worry about it pathologizing people who engage in BDSM a little bit. Uh, so I'm mm-hmm. not not entirely cool with that, but that obviously you know they're using this this interaction between Rachel and Ferdinand in this episode to demonstrate how she is is has evolving or is evolving or at least is pretending to evolve. I still don't trust her. I don't know if I should take her seriously. <laughs> As you mentioned, the fact that Kira seems to trust her, I'm trying to take solace in that. Yeah, me too. Because Kira's been pretty trustworthy. Her her instincts have been good thus far. It's true. But yeah, I. I don't know. I uh, I take less of an issue with the line just because that relationship and the nature of it has never been portrayed as healthy. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, you know, the thing with Paul in season two and Rachel is clearly not uh, not an ideal representation of of anything. <laughs> Rachel has problems. Rachel has has problems. It's it's true. But yeah, the whole thing with Ferdinand, I it makes me nervous cuz Ferdinand just kept getting rejected in this episode. And as soon as it happened, I'm just kind of like, "Oh, this is not going to be good." Yeah. And and I felt very uncertain as to how he was going to behave, what he was going to do. I knew that clearly him not being on board with Rachel's new direction for both herself and the clones, etc., was not sitting well with him. However, just I- makes me think of Glee. <laughs> However, I wasn't sure how that was going to manifest. And because I, I almost wonder if Ferdinand had actually come upon Sarah in Felix's apartment rather than MK. What would have transpired? I almost wondered if he, since he has been something of a not quite trustworthy ally to the clones in the past, if he would have formed some sort of alliance with Sarah, because they have that exchange earlier in the episode about how, you know, are you really on board with this? I've seen you kill a Neo. I know you don't like Neos. But right. so I, I and then that's something I like about Orphan, Orphan Black generally. I feel like I don't I don't always know where it's going. 
And that's a good thing, Mm -hmm. right? You don't want to be able to, for every show you watch at least, sometimes it's comforting to kind of know, okay, and then they're going to encounter a hurdle, and then they're going to overcome it, and then there's going to be kissing, and that's comforting, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's also nice to have shows where it's not just clear from the beginning where the episode is going. Right. Yeah, Orphan Black is not one of those shows. If you want one of those shows, go go watch Law and Order. <laughs> they're going to talk to two people who they have as suspects. They're not going to be the the killer, and then the third one is going to be the killer. <laughs> Chris, you just ruined it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> third guy's the killer. Um, no, but Orphan Black is totally not one of those shows because I think you're right. Had he encountered Sarah, I think. Some of the stuff could have played out similarly, but also I feel like Sarah might have talked him into an alliance. You're right. Mm -hmm. Because that is, I think part of what was so terrible about it being MK was because he specifically had unfinished business with MK. Yeah. And it felt like that compounded with the other things that were going on just set him off. But, like, he definitely has to die by the end of the season now, right? I feel like he has to. He he killed a clone on screen. I, I feel like he does. He has to have some sort of punishment. If he's not going to die, he's got to be defeated in some way. And, like, it was, it was brutal, that scene. It was. <sighs> and I must confess, I was rather confused by that sequence with, with M.K., talking to Sarah, and then talking to Ferdinand. And maybe I'm just being dense, but I feel like I'm. we might be missing some information about MK, because I didn't 100% understand why she was so determined to stay behind. I have a couple of theories on this. I guess really mostly just the one which is based on what we saw with her interactions with Ferdinand last season. Because she, like, lured him to Beth's place and tried to kill him. So part of me wonders if she was trying to make a second attempt on his life. I I mean, we did see her with the knife there. Yes. I definitely think in that moment, yes, she was going to attempt to kill him, even though, you know, she's ill, she's smaller than he is. I knew she wasn't going to be successful. Uh, But I think for sure she was trying to kill him when she had the knife. But even leading into that, I wasn't entirely sure what her motivation was. If It was just because she was sick and tired, like literally sick, and also tired of running that she decided to stay. But at the same time, it's like, why, why now? Is it just that she's so sick? Because, you know, she left and went into hiding not that long ago in the timeline. Yeah, but at the same time, I don't know. I think the fact that it was pretty imminent, his showing up at the loft, it could be that she didn't want to slow Sarah down. But she was planning to stay behind at Felix's before Ferdinand even showed up, before she even knew Sarah yeah. and Ferdinand would arrive. That's true. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, because that was the whole plan, was she was supposed to meet them, and cause he, and Felix tells her, no, 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 she hasn't showed up. She's still at my apartment. And so Sarah goes and leaves Ferdinand there, and that's how it leads to that confrontation. So she she didn't know that that was going to happen uh, when she planned to stay behind to begin with. I right. actually wondered, because there's, there's that fact, the fact that she didn't follow through on the plan, and then she told Sarah, you know, you shouldn't have come, I'm not going to go. So there's that piece of it. And the other piece of it was when Ferdinand was, you know, assaulting her, I guess is the best word. And she kept saying to him, I'm not afraid of you anymore. I actually kind of wondered with the combination of those two, if she was going to kill herself, if she had even at that point, maybe even like taken pills or something like that, where she knew she was going to die eminently because she was just tired of dealing with her illness. So I just, I'm a little confused by that sequence with MK and her motivations, and I'm wondering if I'm missing information, but maybe I'm just being dense. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there there entirely could be something we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. It's this show. I wouldn't doubt it at all. But yeah, at the same time, I do think that that's probably a good assumption for the time being, is that 
she was just kind of tired of it and accepting her fate, perhaps, Hmm. for lack of a better term, or at least one that I can think of at the moment. Obviously, her death was was terrible and violent, and it was supposed to be terrible and violent. Mm Mm-hmm. But I am I'm left with wondering why did it happen story wise, and by extension, was it necessary? Because when it, whenever it comes to characters, pretty much all character deaths, but especially if the character is is played by by a woman, a person of color, it's a character who is not represented all that much. MK, you know, she she was a, a neurotypical. I always have to ask, like, was she fringed? You know, was the character fringed? And and if I think we've mentioned this terminology before, but just as a reminder, I'm referring to the concept of women in refrigerators, which was popularized by Gail Simone, essentially referring to the practice of killing. She was talking specifically about killing female characters for the sole purpose of furthering the plot line of a male character. So I feel like that's a question I want to pose. I'm, I don't know that I have an answer to it, but I was curious what you thought. It's complicated. I I feel like my gut answer is no, because I don't feel like her death was about somebody else, even though there were the elements where like Ferdinand's calling her Rachel and stuff. And that perhaps muddies the issue. But she chose to stay behind. And it felt very much like a last stand kind of moment. Okay. So. So like Paul with the grenades, you feel like this is her last stand? You know, kind of. This is my sacrifice I'm making to protect people I care about, or this is my my last attempt to, in her case, maybe avenge Nikki's death. Right. Mm. I know it's it's not that simple, this question. I'm not claiming to answer it. I just, I don't think it necessarily is. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm at the same place right now. Because I, while I do think it does enable a plot line for Ferdinand, it's not like they didn't have a history, the two of them. And, right. But it, it does feel, I, I guess I'm a little disappointed that MK was brought back in this episode and then was killed in the same episode. Mm-hmm. So it to me, I think that does muddy it a bit in that it feels like she showed up for the purpose to be killed by Ferdinand. And, I, and I'm not saying, you know, that's potentially reductive, but I think it's one of those situations where I need to see where this goes. The fact that Ferdinand killed MK, what comes from that to figure out how I really feel about this writing choice to kill her here. Yeah, it's like... I don't necessarily hate that choice. I have issues with it for sure. But I don't know ultimately how to feel about it just because we don't know what the rest of the season holds. Right. And as you say, if there is more information about MK that we haven't learned yet, that could color our interpretation of of this too. Because MK is the type of character who I feel like she could convey more information to the characters after she died. And they've done this before with like videotapes from, from Jennifer and finding writings and such from Beth. So it is not beyond the realm of possibility that MK can assist the clones, you know, quote unquote, from beyond the grave in a way, you know, she did things before she died that were helpful to them, or at least can in retrospect could be useful to them. So it's it, it doesn't mean that necessarily her, her utility and her involvement in the story has to end here. Mm-hmm. But she's not alive anymore, and that makes me sad, Chris. Me too. I'm, I'm bummed that they did this. And as everybody who's listened to our episodes before knows, like I, I just generally object to character death. I think it's kind of gross, but... Yeah, well, we'll see where they go with it. And especially when, and, I, and I, I know this is subjective, but especially I object to character death when I feel like the usefulness, the interestingness of that character is is still relevant to the storyline. You know, I kind of, I didn't mind so much that they killed Paul because it did feel like 
his usefulness to the story had petered out a bit. Mm -hmm. So that one didn't didn't bother me really all that much. But in this case, I, I do feel like there was more that you that MK could have been useful for in the story. So I, I, I feel like losing her at this point I, I will feel like a real loss to what the story could have been had she stuck around. Yeah. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. We have to see how it plays out. We have to see how it plays out. Yeah. yeah. We did get an email from Colby titled something along the lines of, well, I quit. <laughs> And he says, unnecessary, gratuitous violence. In regard to, to MK's death? In regard to MK's death, yes. And then Suzette sent us a, a tweet saying, I feel like I have been stomped to death to raise the stakes and make a point that is pretty implicit after four seasons. So I, I don't necessarily fully 100% agree with either of these comments, but I also don't disagree with either of them either. <laughs> so right. I just feel I feel really conflicted about MK's death in this episode. Yeah, me too. It's like I I share the emotion of these sentiments, but at the same time like unnecessary gratuitous violence. Was it gratuitous for sure? Was it unnecessary? I don't know yet. And I feel horrible saying that, mind you. I feel horrible saying that. But at the same time, we don't know where this is going. We don't know. Because it's the show, we don't really know everything, you know, by by its nature. So at the end of the season, I guess we'll see. We'll revisit this, right? Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> I am emotionally drained, Stephanie. I know. I know. Returning to Rachel for a moment, we received some feedback from a couple of people, one of whom, Victor, who has sent us feedback in the past, he does not like Rachel, and I don't blame him. And uh, Victor was reminding us, I believe after the first episode, so I'm going to edit what he said in, in a bit, only eight more chances to kill Rachel. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about her dying by the end of the series. In a way, if she did, I would probably feel like deserved it, but... Yeah, we'll we, we'll see how that plays out. I'm just so uncertain about Rachel right now, as always, I guess. I was, I was going to say, it's one of those things, I feel like at this point, they might make us not hate her and then kill her. It's possible. I don't, it's such a TV thing to do, though. Like, I, I can't tell if that's where this is going or not. I don't know that they can make me not hate her. That's fair. Yeah. But, like, what is going on with her? Something is going on with her. And then we also received some feedback from Joe. Do you want to read that one? Sure. Joe says, Rachel told Kasima that she knew how difficult it was to administer the cure to one's own body because I believe she gave herself the dose as soon as possible. She just was much healthier than Kasima. Rachel knows that Charlotte is her own progeny, so I hope that she is cured next. I also hope that having Kasima on the inside will force Rachel to choose to be more protective of her fellow clones than she was when Helsinki happened. I am a sucker for good redemption stories, but considering how murderous Rachel has been so far, I'm not optimistic she makes the right choices. And I will say, her reaction to learning that Ferdinand had killed MK, while she seemed focused on the fact that Ferdinand had disobeyed her, she did seem more upset about it than I feel like we've seen her be in the past in regards to violence done to her fellow clones. Because before, she was the one ordering the violence done. Exactly. But yeah, I don't know. Because it, it does seem like there's maybe... Well, and and I mean, this was pretty well established. There's there's a new sound, new a new sound, a newfound sense of peace to Rachel, mm. which I find unnerving. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, hmm. Are you like me, equally suspicious of people who meditate? I am so suspicious of people who <laughs> meditate. <laughs> I'm not surprised that you are now that you mention it. <laughs> not in real life on television shows people who meditate on television oh. shows i feel like are always untrustworthy like mm -mm. <laughs> I, something's weird about you i just i just know it <laughs> is it is it like people who button their shirts all the way up yes it's it's just off <laughs> it's a signifier of of them hiding something 
incidentally, can I mention this? I was super tickled. I got called out on Tumblr the other day because somebody was talking about how Kara on Supergirl buttons her shirt up all the way and that means she's a lesbian. Whatever. And then somebody like quoted that. and She's clearly bisexual. <laughs> she, uh, yes. First of all, clearly bisexual. Second of all, somebody quoted that post and said, you know, oh, don't let don't let Stephanie from Tatiana's everyone hear you say that. Because I would like to say, Kara does not always butt her, button up her shirt all the way. <laughs> See, clearly bisexual. <laughs> Sometimes Some... it's buttoned all the way, not always. Yes, exactly. She tends to button it up when there's a Peter Pan collar, which I understand that. It does look better that way when you're wearing a Peter Pan collar. But go look at her button up shirts that she wears at Catco. They are almost always, she has a top button open. But it really tickled me that somebody mentioned my buttoning the shirt up all the way dislike so thank you to whomever said that you made my day oh stephanie <laughs> moving on to somebody who doesn't button up her shirt all the way because i don't think she owns a shirt with buttons is Casima. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue <laughs> thank you we just got a little bit of Casima this week and we see her following delphine's hint of where to look for more information on revival yeah so we get that scene of her questioning slash examining Aisha, which of course gets interrupted because that dude does nothing but interrupt. He is the worst. That's all he does. <laughs> well, actually, Kasima. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stephanie. <laughs> <sighs> I, I was telling my dad the other day that you were annoyed with that guy and you were like, get a name. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have one. It's irking me. <laughs> You know who got a name in this episode? Mr. Frontenac. He has a first name now. He has two names. Surely he could share one with the messenger. <laughs> hey, buddy, uh, can I borrow a name? <laughs> so, yes, I'm sorry. The messenger, who needs a name, interrupted <laughs> Kasima talking to Aisha to take her to meet P.T. Westmoreland. So we now have a face to go with a name. If, in fact, that is P.T. Westmoreland. <laughs> He's at least the person calling himself P.T. Westmoreland. Can we can we say that, Chris? Uh, did he confirm that he was? That's a good point. Because <laughs> he did ask, or Kasima. I'm, I'm kind of joking. I, know. I mean, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't, but. Because does, doesn't Kasima ask him, is that really you in the photo? I don't think he actually responds. He does not. Mm. No, he does say something, though, about how that. Galapagos turtle was was uh Darwin's and how she lived to be two hundred sixty three or whatever it was and which is a record just like mine. So he implied that he is a hundred seventy year old PT Westmoreland, but I don't think he ever actually said it. And yes, I realize I'm being super skeptical uh and and just stubbornly so. I understand that. I like you for that, Chris. That is <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Makes me like you. I, I will not meditate in your presence. <laughs> Appreciated. <laughs> or button up my shirts all the way. <laughs> I, too, am still very skeptical of P.T. Westmoreland. It felt like he was trying too hard mm -hmm. to seem old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that whole... Well, oh, because the clothes? Because of the clothes, because of his reference to, oh, you know, old Conan Doyle, he said this and that and the other. It just felt like he was trying too hard to sell the I'm really old thing. Okay. Did you also space out during the cheese story? I really stopped listening during the cheese story. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't space out during the cheese story. <laughs> I got the point of it by the end of it, but I, I realized at some point, like, man, I have checked out. I have not heard his last, like, five sentences, probably. <laughs> oh, dear. Not a fan of the Conan Doyle? <laughs> Apparently not. Apparently not. So I, too, am, am also skeptical of if that really is a 170-year-old man. Uh, but we did get, uh, this is more feedback from Joe, who said that he disagreed with you, Chris. Mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely sure if he really disagrees with you. But he did remind me of some stuff that I'd kind of forgotten about, so I thought it was interesting. And, yeah, me too. And, yeah. And let's, let's, okay, let's, I'll read what Joe had to say. Rachel's cybernetic eye gave her a POV transmission from an external source. I believe that it's PT who built Rachel's eye, and it is linked to one he has himself. 
He communicates with her by deliberately showing her images he wants her to see. She initially saw the swan floating and then the face of the messenger guiding him through revival as villagers nonchalantly worked as they passed. She then saw the decapitated swan, which she took as a directive that she needed to eliminate Susan as the head of Neolution. If she sees what he sees, then it stands to reason that the reverse is also true, and he witnessed Rachel's attacks on Susan and Sarah. That is why he immediately knew she had accomplished her mission and paid her a visit at Susan's house at the end of season four. Just as there is a lab in the basement of this house that P.T. built, I imagine there is a more modern scientific facility inside the house at the top of the hill in the village as well. There is probably a road between the two buildings for quick access. Hmm. I feel like that theory and my theory are not mutually exclusive. I feel like it too. I don't think you were saying there isn't a P.T. Westmoreland or he doesn't exist entirely, just that he's not necessarily all he presents himself to be, correct? Yeah, I mean, maybe P.T. Westmoreland is a construct, maybe it's a group of people, maybe it's somebody claiming to be something that they're not actually. I'm not saying there isn't a person, I'm just saying that this whole story sounds fishy to me. <laughs> I agree, it's it's very fishy, and I mean, I don't think we're supposed to trust the guy, uh, but I do not. I'm very skeptical of him and his his intentions. And and just because somebody's a con man, that doesn't mean that they're not technologically proficient. Maybe that makes them an even better con man if they are technologically proficient, right? There you go. Because that's how the, the man behind The Wizard of Oz got away with it. He had lights and flash and all that business. And now you've spoiled Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I, I feel like people can't call spoilers on that one anymore. It's it's a pretty old movie. <laughs> it's been 80 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I am curious if we'll see anything more about Rachel's cybernetic eye in this season. Because that had a very important plot element in season four with her receiving the images and what does that mean, etc. And that's how they first showed us revival and things. Uh, but in, mm -hmm. in these first two episodes, we've yet to see anything from that perspective anymore. Yeah, I don't think they've even mentioned it this season yet. They haven't. Nope. New theory. What if they're somehow using Rachel's cybernetic eye to, like, brainwash her or mind control her? That is an, an intriguing idea. I definitely think that it's, as Joe has just reminded us, it's possible somebody was using images to manipulate Rachel's actions in the previous season. So I do not think it's beyond their own possibility that... The same could be happening now. It was just such a sudden shift. Mm. Sudden and drastic in Rachel's behavior, I mean. Yes. So suspicious. And speaking of shady things, I don't know if shady is quite the right word. It's, it's a little suspicious. It's a little suspicious. That final scene, that final moment with Mrs. S and Delphine. I was so excited. <laughs> Are you just going to try and out-ridiculous yourself every episode? Yes. <laughs> okay. Is that not- I just wanted to be clear. Is that not the point of this podcast? I thought that was kind of our thing. <laughs> Fair. So Mrs. S and Delphine! <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited to see her. I thought it would be weeks before we saw Delphine again. But there she was, talking with Mrs. S. And I had several moments in this episode. I'm not proud. But this was one of the moments where I thought- <laughs> People are just looking really good this week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. You, oh, Mrs. S. You were Ooh. admiring Delphine's sweater, though, it sounds like. <laughs> I was, because you were like, is there something going on between Mrs. S and Delphine? And I'm like, I don't know. I was too busy looking at Delphine's sweater. <laughs> <laughs> There's this very intricate cable pattern on it. It looks nice. And I, I personally, I always love Delphine in a cozy sweater. Okay, I did not say, was there something going on between Mrs. S and Delphine? That is not what I said. I said that my initial impulse when she showed up was like, oh, is Delphine there for a booty call? I have no idea where that came from. It just popped into my head. I'm not proud of don't it. Don't you, don't you know where that came from? I really don't. I mean, I your guess- Your dreams, your <laughs> fantasies. Since I lost my Mrs. Paul International Bad Abs ship- Maybe my heart is moving on and looking for other <laughs> possibilities. 
Though I firmly believe that Delos... Like I need a replacement inten- or a good intentioned monitor. <laughs> I am fully on the Delphine and Cosima, our soulmates train. So I don't know where this came from in my head. I've got a dirty mind. I'm not don't pleased you? with it. I don't! Stop saying that, Chris! <laughs> But then Chris just, like, stoked the flames because she sent me a quote from Grand Manson who talked about Delphine and Mrs. S having something on the side. <laughs> I, I completely just, like, cropped out the the context for it. <laughs> not that not that Stephanie would have minded. She would have seen the context and just been like, <laughs> It's true. So, obviously, that's not what he was talking about. But maybe it is. Who knows? <laughs> But oh man, I I was not I had no idea who was at the door. I, I was kind of like Tony, uh uh who? I I really Delphine was the last person I I would have expected to be there. I don't know why, but it was completely surprising to me. I feel like somebody needs to make one of those like a Tumblr edit where there's the screen caps and they they need to put like a little glow around Delphine <laughs> as Mrs. S opens the door. Oh. <laughs> yeah basically do you have any theories for what they're up to what what is delphine what is delphine up to it was encouraging though because we saw her in the first episode and even though i think it was clear that she wasn't 100 percent in control of her own actions at revival she did seem a bit more complacent with it than i expected her to be so i think this this gives us a little sense of oh something else is is happening with her and what's going on but I mean, this is something we've seen really consistently from Delphine. Mm-hmm. Yep. This, I'm going to look like I'm going along with whatever your plan is, but really, I'm working on my own thing, and uh, it's going to really throw off Kasima and the other clones, because I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> and uh just going to disappear for a while. And then when stuff falls into place, surprise! <laughs> I don't know. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> I, I'm really excited, though, the possibility of Mrs. S and Delphine working together, Chris. I'm excited about the possibility of them working together. Of them working together? I feel like they could be good allies. I am, th- I am, these are literal things that I'm saying, Chris. There is no <laughs> allies. There is no innuendo. <laughs> Uh-huh. And it, uh-huh. it it made me it made me yell at the screen when the episode ended. Like, no more information. And now Delphine probably isn't going to be around for weeks and weeks, and they're not going to follow up on this for a while because that's what they do. <laughs> You're so adorably frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I I kind of don't know how to feel about this because we talk about this a lot. What's the big theme of the show? Autonomy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're sneaking around. Uh, not like that, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> I I just, I don't know. It's not that I don't trust them. It's just a matter of, I don't know, making me nervous because it's going against this whole idea of them trying to gain control of what's happening in their lives. And now the people who love them are doing stuff without them knowing, like very specifically without them knowing. Yeah, because I can understand where Delphine couldn't reveal perhaps all of her thoughts to Cosima within the context of revival, but her mm-hmm. asking Mrs. S not to reveal their conversation to any of the Sestras, that, that is a little uneasy making. It does make me uneasy, but at the same time, I can maybe figure out, like, I, I can see where she's coming from, right? Because they've got Allison under their thumb, they've got Sarah under their thumb. They've got Kasima under their thumb. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, things could get worse if they did know whatever it is that they're working on. Yeah, it, theoretically, for sure. And at this point, yeah, you make a good point. Like the original Clone Club members, they are very much quote unquote compromised in that they're they're under the watchful eye of Neolution uh, in a right. way that they and haven't been previously. Yeah, and art too. So really Mrs. S and Delphine, even though Mrs. S is being watched, I don't feel like they have her quite under their thumb the way that they do art. So right. she's probably the best ally that Delphine could seek out at the moment. Yeah, because for all intents and purposes, Sarah and Kira are cooperating. Mm-hmm. And I think Mrs. S 
more than, say, Felix, has proven herself to be someone who's willing to do the tough things, even if that means someone she loves might not like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I can understand why Delphine would go to her with this type of thing. I mean, she's proven herself incredibly resourceful mm -hmm. with this sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for Mrs. S and Delphine. I am together, too. Even though it makes me nervous. I am too. And not just because they both have good hair. <laughs> it, it's about 30% because of the good hair. <laughs> Maybe 20. <laughs> Since we're laughing more now, we can we can get to the more humorous portion of the episode. Humorous and horrifying, as is her way. We can talk about Helena and Donnie. <laughs> oh, Helena... Her reaction, though, to when they talked about the neonatal doctor was priceless. <laughs> I mean, who can blame her? <laughs> I'm so glad Donnie was there to, like, run interference. Yes. <laughs> yes, because as soon as Helena was alone with that doctor, I knew something bad was going to happen. And then, of course, the doctor pulls out a sharp object and you're kind of like, no. no. Also, don't set it down and then turn your back on it. That's the worst possible thing you could do. It's always a worrisome thing when Helena is left alone with somebody. And then they have the sharp object there. It's You just knew it was a recipe for something not good to happen to that poor doctor. I was still somehow a little surprised by what actually happened. I, well, okay. I mean, not... Not surprised that something happened, but, like, the thing itself, I let out such a horrified noise, even though it was maybe not as bad as I thought it might be. <laughs> Which sounds weird to say also. <laughs> I feel like we need to applaud Helena's progress. She did not kill her. Or even, <laughs> theoretically, permanently harm. Exactly. So, way to go, Helena. <laughs> For that. You've only temporarily maimed her. <laughs> yes. However, I, I feel like you still need to work on your problem solving skills. <laughs> work on non aggressive confrontation. <laughs> you beautiful weirdo, you. <laughs> also, standard standard disclaimer for this podcast if this was a real thing, we would not be laughing. No, no, no. <laughs> This is a TV show, and uh, it's Helena, so sorry, we are. It took me a second to realize that she very resourcefully, very efficiently, had gotten the doctor's tongue along with pinning her face to the bed. Uh -huh. I, was, I just thought it was through her jaw, and then I realized it had gone all the way through both sides of her face and was pinning her tongue, and my thought was... That is incredibly efficient, Helena, because I'm a terrible person. <laughs> you know, it's true, though. Yes, because then the doctor couldn't scream. Because it was, like, scream. through the cheeks and the tongue, because then, you know, couldn't shout. Yeah. I was, though. It wasn't actually shouting. It was just it was just letting out a noise of, of alarm and horror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like in the last episode, the Helena screech was a noise of comfort. It was, but yeah. in this episode, it was it was a a, a noise of terror and horror, <laughs> but also weirdly comfort because Helena was getting away. Yes, while I I, I think we all feel like she overreacted <laughs> to the situation. We understand where her concern came from, and mm -hmm. it wasn't unfounded. No, at the same time, I would hope. Because I believe from, from other Doctor TV shows that I've watched, it, when doctors perform amniocentesis, they're supposed to make it clear that the procedure is optional because it does have like a slight risk of miscarriage if it's performed. Mm -hmm. And so Helena should have been able to say, no, I'm hoping the doctor would have gotten to that point eventually. But Helena didn't let her get there. But then, of course, because it's this show, as soon as that happens, Helena runs out of the room with her unsecured hospital gown. <laughs> And uh, it was pretty funny. It, it 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 was. And then of course there's like the the alarm at the hospital, and uh, Donnie runs away, which he should have. Mm -hmm. So good for him, I guess. Although they had their name, it's not like they couldn't find them after that. Yeah, it surprised me that they checked into the hospital using the name Hendrix. But I guess to maybe access medical services, they had to give them an ID. 
I mean, I would think so. At that point, I think I think rightfully, Dottie was valuing Helena's health and well-being over sneakiness. So. Right. But uh, this this little storyline, we we did learn two things. Not surprisingly, Helena's unborn babies seem to be exhibiting superior healing ability, as Kara did back in season one. And then Helena did tell Donnie where she was going to go hide. So he's the only one who knows. And right. she and he can tell Sarah, but nobody else. Right. But I'm curious where I guess maybe Donnie's gonna try to run back to Sarah because I mean maybe he tried to run back to Allison, but he doesn't have all the information right now and, and wouldn't necessarily think that Allison was at home. That's a good question. Where is he gonna go? Yeah. Hmm. I kind of wouldn't be surprised if he does go back to his house though. He's not incredibly resourceful, Donnie Henry. <laughs> Well, it's just like, even if he went to go find Sarah, would he go to Felix's loft? Would he go to Mrs. S's house? I, I don't know. Sarah isn't exactly the most always in one place type of person. Settled. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. not particularly settled. Yeah. And Mrs. H Mrs. S's house is being watched, so mm -hmm. probably not great to just show up there. So I am curious to see where Donnie is going to go, but we, we do know that he has some important information that likely will be passed on to somebody at some point. Here's hoping. We just got a little bit of Allison this week, and even though she was putting up a brave front for Sarah on the, the video call, it, it seems pretty clear to me she is not particularly cool with what is going on. Have you met Allison? I haven't, in fact, <laughs> met her. But <laughs> I, I, I am aware of her and her personality, though, so yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, poor Allison was being questioned by... I was going to say Art and his new partner, but really it's just Art's partner. Who's just being awful. I don't dislike her as much as the messenger. It's close, though. It's close. At least she has a name. I know. That's, the, that's her one saving grace, is she has a last name. I think just a last name at this point. Maybe I'm wrong. But at least it's one. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Helena only has one name. It's worked for her. There you go. But does it just mean, does Art seem amazingly calm? Right now. Uh, yes, but also that's in character for Art. Yeah, that's fair. Anger, I believe, commented on it in the first episode this season. Because, you know, she handed him that folder with all the the clone information. Mm -hmm. And he was just not reacting. And she commented on it. I forget exactly what she said. But something about him being very cool, at least until the picture of his daughter showed up. So I feel like it's in, in keeping with that. Art's just sort of playing it cool. Because what else is he going to do right now? If you can, you should. And we had speculated that we might see them trying to find other clones in this episode, maybe Crystal, but nothing on that front yet. We did, however, get just a, a slight sneak peek into what's going to be Allison's community event this season, which will lead to, I'm sure dark comedy hijinks <laughs> she's always so busy even when <laughs> being hunted by by neolutionists <laughs> but that's allison's thing right she's our clone who is the most rooted in sort of normal life and right. and that's really how her her storylines tend to progress as she she has her thing that she is trying to like stay normal with except for the whole drug dealing thing but even that she was trying to keep her house <laughs> so allison Trying to keep her house and also get a seat on the council. To conclude with a few random thoughts, uh, Colby mentioned in his email that P.T. Westmoreland's house was the same shooting location used for the Birdwatcher's house back in season two. And I, I did have that moment when they showed it in the premiere, th thinking, that kind of looks familiar. Is that the Birdwatcher's house? D did that occur to you at all, Chris? Not really, quite frankly. No. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just been long enough since watching that that I didn't really think about it. I think they are shooting it from a different angle, uh, but if it is in fact the same shooting location. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised or anything. Because, I mean, there are only so many places to film in Toronto, in and around Toronto. There are certain places that if you watch enough Canadian TV, you're kind of like, oh, it's that place. Mm -hmm. There, There's this set of stairs <laughs> somewhere in Vancouver I have seen on at least half a dozen TV shows. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's that place in Vancouver again. 
it doesn't really bother me that much, but it, it did it did occur to me. I was like, is that the bird watcher's house? I think it might be the bird watcher's house. I'm pretty sure they've used it on Orphan Black again also. Mm. Also like shot from a different angle or something, but pretty sure it's the same place. And while approaching said house in this episode, Kasima asked Mud, who are you? And I was just thinking to myself, please don't say nobody or a disgrace or something, <laughs> something so... <laughs> obvious I, but did it did it occur to you she seemed rather cagey in regards to that yes. question yeah i'm just kind of like something is going on here i don't know what it is but something's going on here but then i just i do that during the entire episode every episode of orphan black <laughs> mud is also pt westmoreland she's one of many that make up the character yes that's my theory it's a ridiculous theory i don't actually mean it but it could be right <laughs> who knows we'll see I mean, I did say that P.T. Westmoreland could just be several people, so maybe maybe she is. Mm -hmm. And then do you want to conclude with Sean's feedback? Thank you, by the way, Sean, for telling us how to pronounce your name. Appreciated. So very appreciated. Sean's comment on MK, I don't know what to say about what happened to her. I think an ugly cry gif or something would maybe possibly suffice. Oh, boy. For Helena... Only OB can have a scene where somebody gets brutally stabbed in the face, then 45 seconds later hit us with instant comedy as Helena waddles bare-bummed out of the hospital. And we celebrate that she got away. Love it. Uh, regarding Kasima, hopefully now that Kasima has met old PT, she will begin the journey from slightly intrigued enough to stay on this stupid island, Kasima, to calling BS on neo-ideology of season one, before she flipped, of course, Kasima. I miss show don't tell Kasima. Doesn't look like that's going to happen in the next couple of episodes, though. Sigh. I'm not 100% sure what Sean is referring to here, but I am on board with Kasima being more skeptical. And I think she did seem skeptical in this episode, so we'll see. I'm actually a little worried about it because I feel like P.T. Westmoreland or whoever is trying to put the whammy on her the way he maybe put the whammy on Rachel. I don't know. Hmm. You think, I don't know, but I'm suspicious, apparently. <laughs> you think she might be seduced a little bit, the way that Leaky tried to seduce her with offers to work on the science herself and things like that? Yes. Mm. I don't know that that's happening, but I kind of worry that that could be happening. That's fair. Because, I mean, it's it's a thing we've seen from Kasima before, right? Because she, she wants the answers. And you can't blame her, but at the same time, makes me nervous. Anyway. Uh, regarding Sarah, in her last scene, Sarah's hair looked great, washed, conditioned, and styled. Glad she took the time to do it in between strategizing saving her daughter from Rachel. Worth it. That comment really made me giggle. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> and her hair did look really good. <laughs> I mean, they're the good hair family, so. They are. Regarding Delphine, you made a comment, I think, in the discussion for episode 209, how weird it was that Delphine showed up to S's house. It's still weird. It was weird to see her in Essa's house again. I was literally thinking that as the scene occurred, I'm like, it's been forever since she's been in Mrs. Essa's house. It's still weird to see her there. <laughs> now, was this before or after you were thinking about booty calls? It was after the booty call. <laughs> thoughts. Booty call was first. And then of course <laughs> my it was. thoughts progressed. <laughs> and ultimately ended up at, hey, it's been a long time since Delphine's been in Mrs. Essa's house. It's still kind of weird to see her here. It was the last time she was there for a booty call. <laughs> <laughs> I am never letting you live this down. Apparently. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I don't actually want them <laughs> to have a booty call. I don't know Somebody why my write mind... that fan fiction and send it to Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why my mind works the way it works. I'm disappointed in myself. You see any two people and you think, they should be kissing now. <laughs> I, I feel like this is your fault, Chris. You encouraged me. <laughs> How is this my fault? <laughs> Never mind. We'll talk about it later. Anyhow, <laughs> to conclude this episode, thank you very much to everybody who sent in feedback. We really appreciate it. We thought after what happened in this episode, we might get a little feedback, and we did. So thank you to people who wrote in. Yes, thank you, everybody. And and thank you to Akua, who sent in a voice message last week. Yes, thank you to Akua. If you would like to send us feedback, which we would really love to receive, you can do so in a number of ways. You can send us an email, feedback at tatianaiseveryone.com. You can also send us voice messages, which we love to receive. 
You can do that in two ways. Record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us, or you can call our listener voicemail line at 972-514-7223. We are also on Twitter at TIE Podcast, and also on Facebook. Tatiana is everyone is part of the Ask Genre TV family of podcasts. You can find our other podcasts for shows like Lost Girl and Killjoys and our catch-all podcast on which we recently covered Supergirl and are about to cover Winona Earp. Finalysis is the name of that. You can find all of those over at our website, askgenretv.com. And in this episode, all of the booty calls were played by Tatiana Maslany. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.